Easter bunnies and Easter egg hunts and lots of stuff. But I want to talk to you about the truth of Easter today. I want to show you some things that is in Scripture that is absolutely amazing when you really start studying and you see what God has placed in His Word, it's absolutely incredible, some of the things that's in there. And uh, unfortunately, the word Easter does appear in Scripture. Actually, it appears one time in the King James. I, that's the only one I use, so if it's in another one, I don't know anything about that. But in the King James, chapter 12, verse 4, it says this. Acts, I'm sorry. What did I say? It's in the Bible. Just look it up. It's there. Open it up. You'll find it. Acts, book of Acts, chapter 4. No, chapter 12, verse 4. Oh, it's going to be a long day. I can tell that right now. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four <laughs> quadrarians. What that is, is four groups of four soldiers. The soldiers did everything in fours there. Of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now that word Easter, if you look it up, in the Greek, which is what Acts is written in, it is the Greek word for the Hebrew word, Passover. And I went through and looked at several commentaries on that. And uh, all of them say basically the same thing, that it's mistranslation, shouldn't be there. But Barnes has a lot to say about it, and I just thought I would just throw this out at you just because I can. And it says, uh, there never was a more absurd and unhappy translation than this. The original is simply after the Passover. And then he gives the Greek word and the Hebrew word. The word Easter now denotes the festival observed by many Christian churches in honor of the resurrection of the Savior. But the original has no reference to that, nor the slightest evidence that the ever such a festival was observed at any time uh, when this book was written. The translation is not only unhappy, it does not convey at all the meaning of the original but because it may contribute to foster an opinion that such a festival was observed in the time of the apostles. The word Easter is a Saxon uh, of origin and is supposed to be derived from Erstor, whatever, the goddess of love, or Venus uh, of the north, in honor of whom the festival was celebrated by our pagan ancestors in the month of April. And that comes out of Webster's. And you can look at any dictionary and get you know, Christian dictionary, and you can find this stuff also. And it goes on and on, and it talks about the word, how it was it was mistranslated. And I want and and here's here's what I let me start off by saying this: I don't care if you hunt Easter eggs. That's not my point. You can hunt Easter eggs till your fingers fall off. That's great. I don't care. And you can celebrate. Easter, the resurrection on every Sunday of the year, that's fine, and we probably should. I have no problem with that. But here's my problem. As I have stated here before, I am a seeker of truth. Truth is very important to me. I don't care what the truth is. I just want the truth. And the fact is, Jesus was not crucified on Good Friday, and he did not rise on Easter morning. That is the truth. And when we, any of us, whether it is a pastor or elder or Sunday school teacher or whatever, any time that we teach that Jesus rose on Easter, that is literally a false doctrine because he did not. He did not. Easter started years ago as a, and I don't want to go a whole lot into this, but I want you to understand, the first world dictator 
first world ruler was Nimrod. And Nimrod had a wife by the name of Semiramis. Semiramis uh, deified herself, literally killed her own husband so she could be in charge, which I guess you could say would be the first Jezebel, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, had a son, uh, an illegitimate son, by the way, uh, and his name was Tamoz, and you can go from different cultures and find different names for him, but Tamoz was uh, the son. And uh, they had temples for Tamoz and temples for Semiramis. When Semiramis died, they said that she came back in an egg and landed in the Euphrates and uh, by the name of Eshtar and started the religion, and it became Easter and yada, yada, yada. Understand, during the Emperor Constantine's reign, when Constantine was in power, there was a lot of friction between Christians and Jews and the, the Roman legions and Roman kingdom. Constantine saw a sign in the, in the sky one time. It was shaped like a cross or a sword, depending on how you look at it, and said, by this you will conquer. And he took it as that, that was his cue to make Christianity the state religion. And so that's what he did. And it was probably the worst thing that ever happened to the Christian church. Because when he made Christianity the state religion, all these other false religions, all these other cults that was there that worshiped Buddha and whatever, you know, Zeus and Hermes and all these other gods that they had, only thing they did, they went out on the building, took the name down and put Christianity up there, and on the inside, nothing really changed. And so at that particular time, a lot of false doctrine, a lot of uh, paganism entered into the Christian church because Constantine, because what he did, and all everybody just switched names. They didn't really switch worship and what they taught. They just switched names. And um, around 365 A.D., at the Council of Nicaea, there was what's called a quadrescent, quad, uh, what's their names? It's a big name. It means 14, Latin for 14. Don't make any difference. You'll find it if you look it up. They did not want, they did not want to worship the same day of Passover that the Jews were doing. They were against the Jews. So they held the Council of Nicaea at that time, and they said, in fact, Constantine's own words, and I have it written right here if anyone wants to see it, he said, we will not follow what those people, meaning the Jews, have done. They have corrupted, they have polluted, they have defiled their hands with the blood of Jesus, and we're not going to do that. And so they voted that Easter will be celebrated on the Sunday after the spring solstice of the full moon, and they've got this formula figured out that it will be on that Sunday, but it will never show up on Passover because they were against the Jews. And that's where Easter came from. That's where Easter came from. It never was a Christian holiday. And I just want to start with that premise, and, and you, can, you can research this all on your own, but I'm going to show you in Scripture what Easter really is about. Amen? Father, I just thank you and I praise you for this time. Lord, I just ask that you give me the wisdom to speak your truth, Lord God. Give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, to embrace what you have to show us. And Father, I pray that the overhead will continue to work as I do this. And we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. There are seven feasts of the Lord. The Lord has devised his own feast. These are his feast. And look, okay. In Leviticus 23:1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, 
which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. These are not the feast of the Jews. These are God's feast. These are His. How many people in here belong to God? Then these are your feast also. And those feasts are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. These are the seven feasts the Lord has established. These seven feasts are followed every year by the Jews today. Nothing's changed. God hasn't changed. God doesn't change. So I want you to understand these are His feasts. These are not, these are not the feast of the nation of Israel. These are not the feast of, of the Jews. These are not the feast of somebody else. These are God's feasts. He established them, and He changes not. Now then, I want you to look here. We're going to look at Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. We're going to look at Passover today because Passover is when Jesus was crucified. And if you look at this, you'll see that these are all around, all seven of these are around harvest times, which is very interesting, not for today, but for another time. It's very interesting to note that these are around the harvest times. Uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruit is around the barley harvest. That's when they're harvesting the barley. Pentecost was when they started harvesting the wheat. Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles was at the end gathering, at the end of the year, the end gathering, or the grave harvest. And it's interesting that if you look in the book of Revelation, toward the end of the book of Revelation, you see an angel coming out with a sharp sickle, and it says that the harvest is ready. Thrust in your sickle and gather the grapes for it is the end gathering. At the end is the grape harvest. So it's interesting to see that. But the ones we're going to talk about, well, the only one we're going to talk about today is Passover. In Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, it says, Three times a year shall all your males appear before the Lord thy God in the place where he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread... The Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, you count 50 weeks from after first fruits to get to Pentecost. And the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the fall feast. These three feasts are considered the high holy feast. They are Sabbaths. It's important, and we'll get to that, and I'll show you what, why that's important. But it's unleavened bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. These are the three high holy Sabbaths. And the Bible tells us that during the millennial reign, we will still be celebrating those three feasts. In fact, every nation has to have somebody show up in Jerusalem or there will not be rain on their crops during the millennium. These feasts will be observed during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He said, these are my feasts. Now, we, when you think of feast, you think of a celebration, a feast, uh, food, a big table of food, and, and that would be great. That's wonderful. But here's what the Hebrew word, which is moed, means. That word feast means an appointment. It is an appointed time. God said, these are my appointed times. God has a calendar. It is a fixed time, and we know that God doesn't change, so neither do these. And if God has a calendar, we ought to know what that calendar is. By the way, Hebrew has two different calendars. We have a Gregorian calendar, which came from a Julian calendar, and the, and the Jews have two calendars, which is a, the religious calendar and an agricultural calendar. What calendar do we go by? That's why there's so much confusion on dates so many times, because we have so many different calendars. But what I want you to see is when you see feast, that means an appointed time. It's not just, uh, not just having food, but however, all seven of these feasts were a time of celebration. These were not somber, set on a stone, cry, and boo-hoo. These were celebrations. They partied hardy during these feasts. That's what they were for. That's what they were for. It says that there were holy convocations. Well, what in the world is a convocation? Well, if you look it up in the, in the Hebrew, it's mikra, 
and it means something called out. It's called out. That is a public meeting, an act of persons, but also it's a rehearsal. This is a holy convocation. God said, you will proclaim this holy convocation, and it will be a rehearsal for you. Understand something. The Jews have been celebrating Passover for over 3,500 years. Over 3,500 years they have been celebrating Passover. And they have been rehearsing it and rehearsing it and rehearsing it. What was it? When you have a dress rehearsal, what is a dress rehearsal? It's when you practice for the real thing. Well, guess what? Jesus came. Jesus came and died on that cross, and that's what Passover was about. And the Jews missed it. They missed it. Jesus said, you should have known the time of your visitation. You should have known this. It's all through the Scriptures. You've been rehearsing it every year. And when it came time, they missed it. They didn't see it. Speaking to the children of Israel and say, this is how it's actually written, concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Here it is in the, in the translations that we just looked at. Speaking to the children of Israel and say, concerning the appointed times of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be a rehearsal, even these are my appointed times. There was a time coming. He was telling them, there's a time coming. I want you to rehearse this every year so that you'll know when it was going to come. Leviticus 23, 5, it says, and we need to listen to this because it's going to come back to us here in a little bit. In the 14th day of the month at evening is the Lord's Passover, the 14th day of the month. In fact, it is the first month. Now, that's confusing because this is, the, this is where God changes the calendar. He says this will be the first of the year, the first of the months for you. This is the first of the year. He's changed the calendar. It used to be Teshri. Their month Teshri was the first of the year. In fact, Teshri 1 was the Day of Atonement, and that is when they say the earth was created was on Teshri 1. I mean the Day of Trumpets, not Atonement, but Day of Trumpets. And God turns around and, and switches it now. Interesting. And he does it for Passover. He says, in the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the second feast. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. The Feast of, uh, the feast of Unleavened Bread lasts seven days. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no severe work therein. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is another holy convocation. And so they have in the second one. The Lord speaks to Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, and saying to them, That when you come into the land which I give you, you shall reap a harvest thereof, and you shall bring a sheath of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Next week, we're going to talk about first fruits, which is when Jesus rose from the grave. And there's a lot of incredible stuff into that. Today, we're going to talk about Passover. This is when Jesus actually died. We're looking at the scriptures, giving us the basis for all this. In Exodus 12, 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and said, And Aaron, in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. There it is. He's changed it. This is the first day of the year. This is what they use now. Speaking to the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take unto uh, them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for a house now then here's what they're supposed to do the 14th day is Passover on the 10th you bring the lamb into the house the house the lamb represents 10 people 10 people can be fed with that lamb you bring the lamb into the house on the 10th. The kids get attached to it. They look at it. They play with it. And they also examine it to see whether or not it's without spot or wrinkle. <laughs> wrinkle. 
without spot or blemish. I'm sure it had a wrinkle. In 2 Peter 3, it says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. They held that lamb for four days. From Adam until Jesus was 4,000 years or four days. Jesus was held from Adam till the time he was born, four days. And then the lamb of God appeared on the scene. So if it was coming up Passover, it would be our duty, not as Christians, but back then, to bring a lamb into our house four days prior to that. And you get attached to it and everything else. But on Passover, you slaughtered the lamb. Now there's little hints and stuff that you have to see through Scripture and you start putting this all together. John 12, 1 says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Once he was raised from the dead, he became a witness of Jesus, and, and at that time, the Pharisees wanted to kill him again. That was the eighth Six days before Passover was the 8th. So why is it starting to give us all this information? On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, uh, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, uh, took branches, palm trees, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. That would have been the ninth, going into the 10th. Now then, understand Hebrew. The day for Hebrews, the day begins at 6 p.m. See, for us it begins at midnight. For most of us it begins when we wake up the next day. But for the Jews, 6 p.m. sunset, but they say 6 p.m., is the new day for Jews. So as he's coming in on the 9th at 6 p.m., it will be the 10th. When he, came into the, when he came into Jerusalem riding on that donkey, one of the first things he did was he went into the temple. There are the money changers, the sheep people, selling goats and doves and whatnot. He fashioned a whip, and he went in there, and he started kicking over tables and running the money changers out. And he says that you have made... I said, this is uh, my father's house should be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. And he runs all these people out. At that time, the Pharisees and the city leaders said, this man's got to die. He's missing with our program here. He's got to die. And so immediately, what they start doing? Finding something that they can accuse him of. They started the examination. They started looking at him. What has he done? What has he said? We not, we've got to find something that we can accuse him of and kill him. Blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. That is Psalms 118. During Passover, there's five psalms that is sang, 115 to 118. I'm sorry, 113 to 118. Five psalms. The 118 is the one that has the, been the last song that they'd be singing. And in that, I want you to understand what they say in there. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus sang that psalm knowing what he's getting ready to face. This is the day the Lord has made. And yet the Jewish people, Israel at that time, did not understand even when they rehearsed this time and time and time again, they didn't see it. As Jesus was riding in to Jerusalem, he rode in the eastern gate, and they were praising him, Hosanna, Hosanna. But understand, on the north end of the temple, all the sheep that were going to be slaughtered that, for that Passover was being brought in also. 250,000 
sheep. Josephus, who was a historian contemporary to that time, he was there at that time, and he says in here that figuring that there were 10 people to sheep, there was 250,000 sheep in there, that there was a quarter of a million people in Jerusalem for that feast. There was a quarter of a million people in there to celebrate Passover. And while they were all there, in the northern gate, all these sheep were being brought in to the temple to be inspected, to make sure none of these sheep had a mark or a blemish of any kind on it because they had to be perfect. So while all the sheep were coming in the north side, in the eastern gate, the Lamb of God was coming in also. And those, in that next few days, and they sent unto him certain Pharisees and the, and the Herodians to catch him at his words. Now the chief priests and the elders and the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. They found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, it takes two that agree. That's the law. It takes two that agree. <coughs> Excuse me. They found none. At the last came two false witnesses that agreed and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's what they had on him. That's what they had. They took him to Pilate. They took him to Herod. They brought him to the Sanhedrin. There were six examinations, six group of people that examined him, and they could find nothing. Herod says, I see nothing of what you have accused this man of. I don't see it. But yet all the more, they hollered. Pilate finally said, I wash my hands of this. Let his blood be upon you. And then they said, yes, let it be upon us. They compelled Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. They pronounced a death sentence on him. So they took him to Golgotha. And they bring him to the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Why does it tell us that? It was the third hour. What time is that? Nine in the morning. It's also the time of the morning prayer. It's also the time when all the sacrifices begin to take place at the temple. During the morning prayer... All of the sacrifices started coming in. They were bound up and, and, and bound to the what's called the horns of the altar. The, ninth, the third hour is, is 9 a.m., the hour of prayer when sacrifices begin. Blessed is he, it comes in the name of the Lord. And verse 27 says, God is the Lord which has showed us light. That's what you heard this morning. We are not in the darkness, but we are of the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even until the horns of the altar. The altar was a huge brass, huge brass thing, and it had these horns that came out, and that's where they bound all the animals that were to be slain. All the priests, the priests were divided into 24 courses, but during the feast, all the priests had to be there because they've got 2,500 lambs to slaughter. And so while they nail Jesus to the cross over here at the temple, they start slaughtering the lambs, applying the blood, having the burnt offerings. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, 
whatever that, yeah, however you say that, however I would pronounce it, it wouldn't be the right Hebrew word. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Verse 46 is about the ninth hour. Why is that important? Why is the ninth hour important? Because that is at 3 p.m., and that's time of the evening sacrifice when all the sacrifices were done, and the last Paschal lamb that was to be brought in and slaughtered by the high priest was to be done. And so at 3 p.m., when all the sacrifices over here were done, Jesus on the cross over here gave up the ghost. He died. He fulfilled Passover to the minute, to the minute. God, thousands of years ago, instituted this. Jesus came and fulfilled every part of it to the letter, dare I say, to the minute, fulfilling the feast of God as prescribed by God himself. And because the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was the high holy day. That was the high Sabbath. They could not, see, the Passover is not a Sabbath. Everyone thinks it is. It's not. And that's, that kind of strikes me as strange, but it's not. And because... The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the High Holy Day. They could not allow the people to be on the cross. When, what, when's a new day? 6 p.m. It's now 3. So they ordered, go around and make sure they're dead. Start breaking their legs. Make sure they're dead. Then came the soldiers to break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he had already, that he was dead already and broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. All through Scripture it says that no, no bone of Jesus should be broken. In fact, during the Passover in Egypt, when it was instituted in Egypt to bring the children of Israel out, the deliverance of bringing the children out of Egypt, the Passover lamb started there, and it was the blood was put on the doorpost, and they give, and God told them how to do it, and says, "Don't you break a leg, don't break a bone in that lamb. Not one bone is to be broken." And it says, for these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. In Exodus, whenever you take the lamb in the house, neither shall you break the bone thereof. Numbers 9.12, uh, nor break any bone of it. Psalms 34.20, he keepeth all of his bones, not one of them is broken. And not one bone of Jesus was broken. Not one bone was broken. But a spear was thrust at his side, and blood and water flowed. This is a picture of the Temple Mound. That is a drain with channels. Remember, they slaughtered 250,000 lambs. Some of the priests, some of their jobs was to take big vats of water and they would come and pour it on the temple mound and wash all that blood into these little troughs. And so out of the side of Mount Moriah was that drain. And while Jesus was hanging on that cross and blood and water flowed out of his side, out of the side of Mount Moriah, out of the side of Jerusalem, out of the side of the temple. And Jesus' body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Blood and water flowed all day long. 
even in his death, there is fulfillment in pictures exactly what's going on. Do you see the incredible design that God had for the death of his son? Do you see that Jesus fulfilled every single thing? And when they departed Ramses, this is this the first Passover when they were in Egypt. When they departed Ramses in the first month on the 15th day, that's the day after the 14th, which was Passover. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of the Egyptians. They were delivered. Pharaoh represents Satan. Egypt represented the world. And here is the, here is the Israelites being delivered because of the blood of the lamb and the death of the firstborn. And it says the Egyptians buried their firstborn. What happened to Jesus after he died? Who was the firstborn of God? And now, when it was evening come, here we come down to the 6 p.m. We've got to get him in the ground. We can't do it on the Sabbath. Because it was the preparation. Preparation of what? Of the high holy day. The feast of unleavened bread. The day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in the sepulcher, which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone uh, upon the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph, it's supposed to be Jesus, uh, beheld where they laid him. They saw where he was laid. When the Jews have a Passover Seder, one of the things they do is they have to get all the leaven out of the house. That's where spring cleaning came from, by the way. They go in there, and the mother cleans the house immaculately. And during the Passover meal, they will take a little piece of leavened bread because they can't eat leaven. It has to be unleavened bread from here on out for seven days. And they take that little piece of leaven, and they'll put it over by the stove somewhere or someplace. And the kids will take a candle, and they'll start looking because they don't have lights. And so they take his candle and they start looking around and they've got a wooden spoon and a feather. And they go around and they'll find it and they go, ah, oh, we found it. And the father will come up with the feather, put the wooden spoon down there and not touch that leaven because leaven represents sin. And he'll take that feather and he'll scoop it up in that wooden spoon. They'll take a linen cloth and lay the spoon, the leaven, and the feather on the wooden on the uh, linen. Wrap it up take it outside the house where they have a communal bonfire and they will throw, everyone throws their wooden spoon, their linen cloth and everything into the fire and burn it. That's the celebration that's still held today. That's what they do. And what we see there is it's the Father with the Holy Spirit representing the feather getting the sin out of people's lives by putting it on the wooden cross where Jesus was, wrapping it in linen what we see right here, Jesus was taken out of Jerusalem, outside the camp, and he would became the burnt offering. Jesus, when he went into the temple, what did he do? He was getting the leaven out of the temple. He was helping his father get the sin out of the temple. Everything in the Passover was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Maybe it's just me. But I think it comes real close to blasphemy to see what Jesus went through. And this, this is just part of it. This ain't all of it. This is part of it. 
to see what Jesus went through. That God the Father, before the foundation of the world, established these feasts, knew that his son was going to die on that cross. And Jesus coming down fulfilled every bit of it, every piece of it to the minute he gave his life for me and you. And for us to teach that Jesus died on Good Friday and rose on Easter when God established the time, in my opinion, comes real close to blasphemy. I've heard people say, we can, re- we can redeem the day of Easter. It never was a Christian holiday. What would you be redeeming? It was a pagan holiday. And it started back under Constantine, changing things because they didn't like the Jews. Now listen, I don't care if you hunt Easter eggs. It's not a sin to hunt Easter eggs. It's not a sin to go to a sunrise service on a Sunday morning. You can do that every Sunday. You can, you can do that every day if you want to. That's fine. But don't teach that Jesus rose on Easter because he did not. He did not. And he did not die on Good Friday. In fact, he didn't die on Friday at all. It was Thursday. You can't get three days and three nights with Jesus dying on a Friday. Can't be done. Next week, we're going to look at the resurrection that he rose on first fruits. And there is a whole bunch of stuff in first fruits that is just incredible. That is just incredible. I don't know. I hope you get something out of this. Like I said before, I, I like the truth. Give me the truth. Never be afraid of the truth. I want the truth. This is the truth. This is scriptural. And you can go back through history and read some of the things that the people have have said. Even some of them have said an angel came, and there's no evidence. The apostolic fathers did it on Passover, but they wanted to change it because they did not want to be under the Jewish stuff. I just want the truth. You can worship God any day you want to and should, but know, know the truth. Don't be afraid of the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen? Amen. Stand up. Like I said, there's a lot of, I've got a PowerPoint of 79 slides, and I stole some to make this one. There's a lot, there's a lot to this, but I want you to see for yourself, scripturally, how important this is, how I think in my opinion, how important this is to God. That he sent his son to die. We ought to know when he did it. And if we're going to celebrate it, we can celebrate it every day, every hour of the day. It don't matter. But know the truth. Don't teach Jesus rose on Easter because he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you and I praise you. Lord, I just thank you for the sacrifice that you and your son did for us. Let us ever hold that day high because it's our eternity. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the truth. I thank you for your son. The blood of Jesus, I thank you for that. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for all of it. Because without it, we're nothing. So we praise you for that, Lord.
And Lord, I just thank you for everybody that's here today, that they heard this word. Lord, I just, uh, I just ask that it just touch them. May they be blessed coming and going the rest of this week. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Shake some hands and hug some necks and greet each other.